Howard said, create it. Create it. Yep. And so Steve underselling it a little bit, I think. And truth of Jesus Christ. Prior to launching Roundwire over 26 years ago, our speaker served as youth pastor at Church of the Rock in Castle Rock, Colorado. Bring his extensive experience engaging next generation audiences in spiritual conversations. Would you please join in welcoming to the Ritz Carlton Ballroom stage, Sean Dunn. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming to the sleepy session. Um, Greg Latimer, you promised you wouldn't snore. You did, but I appreciate coming. Um, and what a great opportunity. I'm so grateful uh, to be here and to share a little bit uh, with you and hopefully inspire and kind of help you understand a little bit how to have meaningful spiritual conversations with the people that you work with and even your kids and grandkids. I think sometimes we overcomplicate it and hopefully we can break that down a little bit. Um, that's what we're doing here. And I do have another session. So yes, is it identical? No, it's not. And I'm very thankful that that uh, we checked in with the, the slides because the wrong session had been downloaded here, which really would have thrown me off. So I'm really grateful that, uh, that we're going to dig in here. But we're going to talk about sharing your faith here. We're going to talk about the younger generations and their spiritual beliefs there. Have you ever gotten a compliment that just touched you to your heart? About a month ago, I was speaking at an event, and uh, 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 I was standing in the crowd in the back, and I and, uh, was talking to a friend, and so he walked up, and I got to know him, got to know his name, and then he turned to me, and he said, and who are you? And the guy next to me said, oh, you don't know Sean? He's the guy that introduces people to Jesus and tells them how to get to heaven. And I thought, wow, I'll own that. I, I'm okay with that. And it just, it really excited me. That's, that's my passion. I'm an evangelist. How do, we, how do we impact people's lives with the gospel? How do we share him in a way that is relevant and meaningful? Um, on Monday of last week, I was on a prayer call with our team. We all work remote, and so we're, we pray Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays on Zoom together. And the, the leader of our Spanish ministry, she said, you know, over the weekend, I took my grandkids to Six Flags. And she said, my husband and I had this experience that really impacted me. I was sitting there, and I was waiting for my kids because they said, we don't go on every ride. How many of you take kids on, on your grandkids on every ride? Are you, are you that much of a glutton, Greg, you do? Okay, I don't. I don't. I sit them out. And we're sitting them out, and Hilda and her husband, Jorge, were sitting there. She said, we were looking in different directions, but we both had the same observation. She said, we turned to one another, and without even realizing that we were thinking the same thing, we started talking about what we saw. We saw people who were lost and lonely and hurting and broken. She said, it changed our perspective in that moment and on that day. We stopped seeing the busyness and the chaos and the crazy crowd, and we started seeing people that are real, and they will do one of two things, this is my language, not hers. One of two things is true about them. They will either suffer through eternity or they will celebrate through it. And if we truly saw people that we, we could not afford to not at least aggressively pray, but I believe we couldn't afford to keep our mouth shut when God opened the door for us. Now, please understand, I'm not coming at this from a legal perspective with you and your business. I'm coming at it from a very simplistic way. But I believe we overcomplicate the way that we share our faith or how we feel that we need to go about it. And so I want to kind of break that down a little bit today, if we could. And um, this is, this is three, these are three things the Lord gave me to run at in December of last year. And I believe he kind of imparted to me, you've got, everywhere you go, you need to remind people that this is true. Because I believe that if the Christian community embraced these things and believed them, our world would be different. I believe that if we really believe that God was good, that we most Christians believe that he's good when circumstances are good. But do we really believe that God is good when we get bad news, when something doesn't go our way, when a dream is broken, when a relationship is struggling? God is still good. Second thing is the gospel is still powerful. See, I, we believe that, but do we believe it? Meaning we believe that that's true, but do we look across at certain neighbors or certain people and think, you know, even co-workers, like they, God, you couldn't break through them. When I, I had high school, kind of an anti-hero for me. He was the jock. He was the one. 
And I actually thought in my mind at that, that point in time, he doesn't need God. Do we think that about certain people? God can't break through there. Do we believe that God's still good? Do we believe that the gospel is still powerful? And do we believe that the harvest is still ripe? Do we believe that? I've had people tell me, I don't see it in the U.S., therefore I don't know that I believe it. I believe it over there in Asia, in Africa. I believe it over there. But do we believe that people are hungry for the gospel here? Because I do. I believe that people are more open to the gospel right now than they've ever been before. They're just waiting for somebody to come and share that truth with them. read a book by Barry McGuire uh, called Ignite Your Life, and this is one of the things that I got from it. Over 80% of the unchurched would like to believe there's God who can make sense out of today's chaos, and they're looking for someone to tell them who that God is. The problem is they don't know how to ask for it. And sometimes their behavior indicates that they're not open, but they are. Let me share a scripture with you, Matthew 9, 35 to 38. There's three parts to this scripture. I love it. It says Jesus is walking and it identifies what he's thinking about the people around him. He looks and he says they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He looked at culture and he said people don't know who to trust. They don't know who's lying to them, who's telling them the truth. They're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Do you believe that the average person in our world today could be classified that way? I do. More than any other time in my life, people don't know to trust. Is the church telling me the truth? Is the world telling me the truth? Is the right telling me the truth? Is the left telling me? They're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. But when Jesus identified culture that way, he identified it as a mess you know the very next thing he said? The harvest is ripe. He identified culture as a mess. And he said in that moment, when you find people confused and struggling and they don't know who to trust, they are more open to the gospel when, than when everything is going great in their life. Harass and help us like sheep without a shepherd. The second thing is the harvest is ripe. You remember what the third thing he said? Pray to the Lord harvest to raise up laborers to go into the harvest field because the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. 20 years ago, 18 years ago, I was sitting at my desk and I scribbled at a question on a post-it note and I stuck it there and I kept it in my Bible for years. The question was simply, after looking at this passage, it simply was this, is it possible that they are more willing to consider and respond to the claims of Christ? then we as the church are willing and equipped to go share him. We think that they're not interested. We think that they're not willing. And they sit there and they say, hey, if you have something to share with me, please come and step into my life, engage with me, and help me. That picture we see behind our church walls and our programs and we look at culture and we think, if they have the if they have questions, surely they'll show up on Sunday morning. Surely they'll walk through our door and they'll ask the right question and they'll say, hey, I'm in need, would you help me? Surely they'll do that. And the culture sits across that street and they look at us and they think, if you've got the answer, surely you'll come tell me. If you can tell me where to find peace and hope and, and he, inner healing, then surely you'll share those things with me. And unfortunately, nobody's crossing the street, and it's time that we do. So let's talk about that. I was at a, wait I was at a restaurant in Chicago having a conversation with a waitress. She walked up, and, and she was very kind and very sweet. She was actually a busser. She was a waitress, and she said, is there anything else I can get for you? And I just looked at her and engaged her and said, hey, how's your, how are how you doing? How's your life doing? You, you doing okay? And she said, yeah, I'm doing okay. I said, really? I said, because they say that a huge percentage of your generation struggles with anxiety most of or all of time took a little bit of step of faith that little prompt that god gives you say you know don't hide behind what you what you know kind of take a step and listen to the lord so i took that step and she looked at me and she said yeah she said i guess i fall in that category i struggle with anxiety i struggle with a broken heart and i looked at her and i said oh i'm so sorry I said, I want you to know there's a God in heaven who understands what you're going through, and he wants to help. You want to know what she said to me? She said, oh, I believe in God, which I knew she did, and I affirmed. Because the younger generations, they haven't rejected God. They just ignore him altogether. She said, I believe in God. I just don't believe that he can heal my heart. I don't believe 
that he can help me with my anxiety or my fear. Here's what she said. I have to do that on my own. That is a statement that I've seen come through in a way that many young people live, but I've never had somebody actually articulate it. I believe in God. He's just either impotent or he doesn't care. Isn't that sad? And I looked at her and I said, I'm so sorry to hear that, and that makes me so sad because I want you to know God's love for you. He hates to see you struggle. And I looked at her, took it a little bit further. I said, you know, actually I want you to know, I want you to know that God is the one who created you and only he knows broke your heart. Therefore, he's the only one who can heal it. And she nodded. She thought that made sense. And I said, and on top of that, my guess is when you're talking to your therapist, took a step of faith that she had a therapist. When you talk to your therapist, you can't even come up with the words to describe your anxiety. You just know that you feel anxious. And she goes, yeah, I, I don't even know how to tell anybody. But I just know what's going on inside of me. And I said, God created you. He can heal that. And she goes, I want to believe it. And I said, can I pray for you? Grabbed her hand she, with her permission, and we prayed. And as soon as we were done, she backed up. She rubbed her arms like they do. And she oh, she said, that was awesome. I have goosebumps. And I said, that's because he's real. What you're sensing is his presence. And he wants you to know his presence all the time. And she looked at me, and she just was so overwhelmed and she got called away on a restaurant emergency. We didn't get to finish the conversation. But as we were standing up, she ran back and she said, she said, Sean, I really want to finish the conversation, but I, I don't have time right now. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow. I said, go to one of our websites. I pointed her to jesuscares.com and log in, chat with one of our volunteers and say, I just had this experience. I sense God's presence. I want to know that all the time. Two weeks later, she got online and she gave her life to Christ. But what it does, you know, praise God. Praise, I mean, if heaven can celebrate over every soul that turns to God, FCCI better. Okay, let's try it again. She gave her life to Christ. Okay, that has nothing to do with making sure you're awake in the afternoon session, so thank you for that. But anyway, what I want to do is we're going to talk about four assumptions and three questions that I use to get people into spiritual conversations all the time. And I believe whether it's an employee, whether it's a server, whether it's one of the kids around the Thanksgiving table, these four assumptions work majority of the time, 97, 98% of the time, and then I'll give you three other tools. So the first one is I assumed that she would respond to kindness. Can I tell you that Christians, we need to step up our game. We need to be kind. Did you know I serve, I have kids who are servers? Did you know they, of course, you've heard this before, but they say Christians are the worst tippers. They are some of the most unkind people on Sunday afternoons. She said, we don't like working Sundays because of the Christians. It should not be that way. I am telling you, I don't care who you're talking to, they respond to kindness. They do not respond to judgment. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says that it is kindness that leads us to repentance. Think about that. Those of shout out, what does the word repentance mean in a biblical preaching session? What does it mean? To turn the other direction, to say, I want to be like you. It says it's his kindness that makes people want to turn in the other direction. Countercultural for us as Christians, because the way we want to phrase it, the way we want to live it is my truth is better than your truth, so you want to be like me. That doesn't work. But when you express kindness, they'll stick around. The second assumption I always make is that they will answer questions. Now, you can't be too invasive. It has to come from a smile. It cannot come from a grumpy, grumpy Gus face. But you just look at them and you say, hey, how are you doing? And then from that first question, you can gauge if they're willing to, to uh, talk to you. Do you know that one of the challenges that we have with our grandkids and our kids is we don't ask them enough questions. We tell them what we know already. I'll tell you, they do not want to be entertained and they do not want to be taught. You want to know what young people want? They want to be heard. So if you take time to listen to them, that earns you the right to speak into their life. I assumed that she would respond to kindness. I assumed that she would answer questions. I assumed that she believed in God. Let me, let me explain. Uh, this is foundational for me. So there are, there's, there's monotheists in the world, there's atheists, but there's a middle group that the majority of people in our nation uh, so on, on this side, let me, let me tell you the stats. On this side, I don't remember if this hand in the explanation was atheists or 
monotheists. Let's go, let's go atheists over here. 7% of millennials are atheists. 13% of, of, uh, of Gen Z are atheists. Do not believe in God. On this side, you've got the percentage of people, and it's 13 and 15% that love Jesus, love church. It's where they find their identity. It's where they find their hope. It's where they find their tribe. But in the middle, there's about 7%. And you want to know how the Urban Dictionary defines the majority of people in our nation? Not as atheists, not as monotheists. They describe them as apatheists. They say that the majority of young people in our nation believe in God but ignore him. That's how the Urban Dictionary defines an apathist. A young person who believes in God but ignores him. So you are not fending them when you start talking to them about a loving God who's compassionate. Yes, God has standards, but start with his compassion and his love and his care, and you will have the ability to tell the whole story that comes with it. I knew she would respond kindness. I knew she would answer questions. I knew she believed in God, and I knew that she would let me pray for her. Now, there's 15, 20% who say, yes, absolutely, you can pray for me, but not here. Like, when you're driving home, pray for me. We go to bed tonight. They are encouraged. When you're, when you're dealing with somebody in your employment, you, all these things work. They will respond to kindness. You have to be, if you want your faith to impact them, they have to see you as a kind individual who cares about them. They will respond to questions. How are you doing? How's your family? Remember what's going on in their life. It earns you the right to go deeper. They believe in God. Most of them believe in God. So you're not going to offend them by going there. And then it, it's very meaningful to say, hey, can I pray for you? I know you can't force it on them. Those are four assumptions that I make in most conversations, and it makes sharing your faith so much simpler. Now let's talk about three questions that I love to use. Three questions. What brings you hope? I love to ask a waitress when they tell me that they're struggling with something. I say, do you have any source of hope? And usually they say, no, I don't. And then you have the opportunity to say, can I tell you what brings me hope? And even if they have something that brings them hope, a lot of times it's fluff and it's meditation or it's something else that's great. But I just want you to know that, that God wants to walk with you through this and then you can take them a little bit deeper. The second one is this. Has anyone ever shared with you how you can be close to God? Do you, do you know that I've never been turned down? When I'm having a conversation with somebody, I will always say that, or not always, but when I do, I've never been turned down. When I say, you know what, I get the scent, I get the impression that you want to be close to God. But nobody's ever told you how. And they say, yeah, no one's ever told me how. Let me tell you how. You are loved by the God who created all of this, and he created you. And he wants to be close to you, too. That's what blows me away. It's not that you want to be close to him, but he wants to be close to you. Unfortunately, there's this huge divide. Has anybody ever told you about that? No, no one ever has. You know what created it? No. It's when we chose to walk away from him and because of our sin. I mean, you can walk them through because if they want to be close to God. Do not buy the mask. Do not buy the hearts. Do not buy the media lies that say they are not interested because people are more open to the gospel right now than they've ever been before. I've already said it. I want to reinforce Matthew 9, 35 to 38. When the world is, is messed up, people are open to the gospel. And right now, they are more open to the gospel than they've ever been. The third question I love to ask is, what do you think Jesus sees when he looks at you? You know, I get two answers to that one. I get either he doesn't see me, I think he's ignoring me, or the second question I get is he doesn't like what he sees. And either one of those give you a great opportunity with love and compassion to step into that conversation with him. Let me tell you what God sees when he looks at you. One of my favorite stories came off our chat line, and some of you probably heard it before, but a young lady logged in, and she said, do I matter? And as soon as I was reading this chat transcript that came from our ministry, I realized how many people do I know that ask that question, do I matter? Do you see me? Can you feel what's going on in my heart? I'm crying out, can you see me? And she's instantly connected to one of our volunteers, and that volunteer took her deep pretty quick. She said, she, first of all, she affirmed her. She said, absolutely. You matter. You matter to me. I'm sure there's people in your life that you matter to, but most importantly, you matter to God. Has anybody ever told you what God sees when he looks at you? She said, no. Is there anyone in this room, even before I continue the story, that, that 
believe that if, if, they, if I tell you what God sees when he looks at you, that you're going to be depressed at the end of that, you're going to feel good. Because God adores you. He's thinking about you right now. The coach took deeper. Let me tell you what God sees when he looks at you. He says that you're the apple of his eye, the crown of his creation. He says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He says that 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 it just takes on, gives eight one-liners out of Scripture about what, what God sees when he looks at that young lady. Then the volunteer said, how does that make you feel, man? Amazing. He said, not only that, but I want you to know that God thinks you matter so much, he doesn't want to spend eternity without you. He made a way so you could spend eternity with him. That's how much you matter to him. Has anybody ever shared that story with you? In our ministry, we call it the rescue plan. And the first question is, what do I have to be rescued from? Which sets it up for you to tell them about the great divide. Anyway, she heard the gospel, and she said, what do you think? Is today the day that you need to step onto that bridge, that you need to cross that, that, that divide because of what Jesus did for you? And she said, absolutely. She said, of course I want to do that. That's usually the response when they understand who Jesus is and what he offers. Of course. You don't have to twist their arm. She said, of course I want to do it. She ended up praying, received Christ. And at the end of the chat, I love this. The coach looked at her and said, not looked, through, through the digital and says, you know, you came online and you asked me a question, do I matter? But I want to turn it on you. Now that you know what God sees when he looks at you, I want to ask you, do you matter? She came on with a question mark. She ended with all caps and three exclamation points. She said, I do matter. Isn't that beautiful? Why? Because she found out what Jesus sees when he looks at you, what, when he looks at her. We actually took that experience and we built another one of our websites called, um, what's it called? Accordingtohim.com. And it's what we do is, is we, we reach out through the marketing and we say, hey, you look in the mirror, you don't like what you see, come explore what Jesus sees when he looks at you. And it's, it's going really well. So anyway, let's keep going here. Um, let, let me tell you, when we train our online volunteers, we have this massive team of volunteers all over the world that, that engage with people online and introduce them to Jesus. And we use this acronym to walk them through it. And it's a great tool. I've had many, many people, grandparents, say that, was, that, was, that helped me frame it. The, the acronym is simply this. You listen. Second thing is you empathize. Third thing is you transition. And the fourth thing you do is then you share. So when you're having a conversation with a kid, with an employee, be sure to listen and empathize. One of the problems that we as men have is sometimes we don't listen. And we don't know how to empathize. And let me tell you, if you do not do these two things, you will not get the opportunity to share. because They will turn and run from you before you get there. But when you look at them and you say, hey, I'm so sorry that you're going through that. But you know, as you're sharing your story with me, what I really hear is there's a hole in your heart. And I think what you're really searching for is God. Could we talk about that? You listen, you empathize, then you transition. So there's a difference between saying to a young person that comes to you and is basically emotional bleeding in front of you. When they look at you and, and they, they start to have these emotions and things going on in their heart, if you say, hey, you need Jesus, it's very different. This saying, after hearing your story, what I believe is that transition is so key. One will shut them down, the other will light them up. And then you get to share the truth that you know that you long to share. In this, let me just encourage you, um, there are different personalities that tend to gravitate towards the top or the bottom of this. The top says, I'm so empathetic and I care so much, but I don't know how to transition, so I never get to share. I talk to so many people like that, and usually they're, they're really kind-hearted, um, deeply, deeply spiritual ladies who just, their heart is broken when they hear the story, but they don't know how to transition. Practice that a little bit. Whereas men, what we do is we just want to share. Let me tell you what you need. And it doesn't work as well. But if you listen, empathize, transition, it gives you the opportunity to share. Um, this is what I, I, I pray, that the body of Christ would live like this. This is, this is the way God has called us to live. Life is too short to waste, eternity is too long to ignore. Does anybody agree with that? We have a short amount of time, it's a vapor. And we have the, this 
opportunity to make as big of a difference in lives as we can. If we take care of somebody emotionally, that's great. If we take care of their physical need, it's great. I'm telling you right now, though, the only thing that lasts is when somebody has transferred from death to life, from darkness into light, they will get to spend eternity with us. As I shared before, they will either celebrate through eternity or they'll, they'll suffer through it. I don't know about you, but I want to take as many as I can to heaven. Do you agree? Um, uh, I want to just finish up here. Um, our, our, our ministry, what we do is we engage with people online. And uh, this is amazing to me. These are our numbers from last year. God really just blew us away. Our commercials were seen 2.2 billion times last year. 85% of that is in the U.S., our kids, our grandkids, going after them, saying, hey, there's a God now who's thinking about you right now. I know you're suffering, but you're not alone. 7.9 million people visited one of our websites. We had 306,604 one-on-one conversations about Jesus. We saw 500, now get this, the average church in the U.S., according to George Barnard, is one person a year give their life to Christ. Last year, we saw 533,000. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. And then this is, this is another, um, another statistic that just blows me away. And I know some people say it's sacrilegious to talk about soul in terms of a dollar figure. But denominations will tell you, churches will tell you, it costs over $35,000 to see one person make a profession of faith. Last year, our all-in cost was $7.97. And uh, it's better this year because we figured out how to speak into their pain and into what's going on. And I do want to close in prayer here if you're interested in learning more. But I, there's, on your table, uh, we created these little books. And all it is is it's testimonies and scriptures about evangelism. It's testimonies that have come through our, our volunteer base in the last couple months. We just created this. You're the first group to see it. But I just want to share this with you because I would love it, if, especially if you're moved and you're an you're intercessor, if you're moved by young people, please take this and maybe use it as just a reminder to be praying for the brokenhearted. The ones that Hilda and Jorge saw at Six Flags that were walking down the street and they were just overwhelmed. This will frame for you some of the things that are going on, but just want to share that with you. And then also uh, at my table back there, this is just a little document that shares the numbers that I just shared with you. But let me just ask you, going back to that initial slide, can we begin to, bl- to live as, as believers? Can we begin to live with these three premises that God is still good, that the gospel is still powerful, and that the harvest is still ripe? We need to be praying. We're seeing it everywhere. Ground is not the only place we're seeing it. You, you've heard it from other ministries, but there is a movement of God among people in our nation. They're desperate for Jesus, and they're waiting for us to cross the street. And I believe that we are going to have amazing stories to tell every time we get together because of employees, because of waitresses, because of kids and grandkids, and because of people online who gave their life to Christ. And because of that, they're going to spend eternity in heaven with us. Could I pray for us? Before you, before you close your eyes, I want to tell you, I'm praying God would stir up in us this inability to ignore the needs, the spiritual needs of the people around us that we would see them with clear eyes and we see brokenness and loneliness and hurting and that God would develop in us the skill set and the ability to speak into those situations, to draw them into meaningful conversations, not a a proclamation of the gospel, but a conversation about the gospel in a way that their barrier goes down and their desire for Jesus goes up. So if you're okay with that, I'd like you to pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, thank you, uh, Father, for sending Jesus to this earth. God, thank you. Lord, we, we just we, we thank you for, for taking that initiative that you didn't wait for us to get to you. You knew we couldn't, so you sent Jesus. And God, in that same manner, thank you, Jesus, for suffering for us. But God, we don't just want to be saved and safe. God, we're willing to step into the battle and we're willing to step into conversations. God, I believe that the majority of people in our nation who are unchurched, God, they're waiting for somebody to introduce them to God who can make sense out of their chaos. You are that God and we are that instrument. So God, stir in our hearts. God, stir us up to to allow us to take those steps. God, break our hearts. God, give us eyes to see their need, what they're struggling with, what they're going through. Give us compassion that we can't ignore them. 
And God, give us the skills that we need to have meaningful conversation with them about Jesus. And I pray, God, for people who long to be used in this way. God, I pray that you'd give them those conversations and they would just begin to, to celebrate the opportunity that, that you've given them to share Jesus in meaningful ways. God, we believe that you are still good. God, we are convinced that the gospel is still powerful. God, and we are convinced that the harvest is still ripe. God, move in our nation. Rescue generation. Draw people to yourself, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Sean, thank you so much. I am just a fan of what you're doing, how the Lord's just working through you and Ground Var. So thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to go over what uh, our presenters are, this, our presenters are for this afternoon. Um, I love getting text, especially when text um, share miracle stories or ways that the Lord's working. Uh, one that came through that we'll share a little bit later. I just want to let you know someone was walking by the prayer room this morning. And just walk by. You know how we do sometimes. We walk by and all of a sudden we feel the tug of the Holy Spirit moving us. And, and we have to go back. And, and then sometimes we have to open the door and walk through it. And that happened. And because of that, you're going to hear an amazing story, a miracle story that happened just this morning with um, one of our wonderful participants. And we'll wait and share that a little later. Uh, so just to get you a little bit excited about to hear another story of miracles. Um, all right, so let's look and see what we have this afternoon. We've got great Ken Boa is going to be talking about legacy isn't just for later. Loved and so enjoyed Ken, Ken speaking yesterday. 